Welcome to the first Tech Hui Talks here on Think Tech. I'm here with my friend John Hanovich. We're going to be talking about his company, IP Video Market, and the difference between lean startups and startups that receive uh, seed money, uh, angel investment models, kind of versus the something that's come in vogue in recent times, which is uh, very small amounts of seed money, or basically companies that are started out of people's apartments with a few credit cards and the money in their pocket. So, John, tell us a little bit about your company and, and your business. Information about business technology is just terrible, um, tends to suck. And the reason why it's terrible is not just because the people don't know what they're doing or they're bad at it. It's really more fundamentally we found out that it's because it's corrupt. The people who put information out on business technologies are generally paid by the people who sell those technologies. Sure. And so that's something basically I didn't sort of realize right away, but I kind of always knew that like, wow, when I was working uh, in Silicon Valley uh, on the manufacturing side, we sort of saw that like, wow, this information is really bad. Why is it so bad? So when I left and came back to Hawaii, it was one of the things that I wanted to work on was to figure out a way to provide better information. And so what it eventually led up to today is in the last three years, we've built uh, a global web platform where we have um, thousands of paying members, tens of thousands of, of, of readers on the site, uh, and we're by far the most read publication on video surveillance uh, within the security industry. That's, yeah, that's amazing. So, um, you know, you came here from the Valley, you worked for a, a company that was funded by Kleiner, um, you have good executive hair, you could have gone in to pitch for some money, why didn't you? Well, I think, you know, the couple of things I learned um, from sort of the experience in the Valley and other experiences in New York before that is that a couple of things is one, um, money doesn't make good strategy. Uh, and I think part of that is, is that if you have money and your strategy is bad, it makes it even worse because you have a lot of people on staff, you're trying to figure out strategic issues. If the strategy basically doesn't fit, it can become a vicious cycle. Uh, the other element I saw is, is that the, the more money that I've had in various startups previously was that there was kind of this push to say like, okay, our, our plans or our goals are much higher. We've got to do a million dollars in revenue the first year or three million dollars in revenue in the second year. And often that's just not realistic, right? Mm -hmm. That the company is not far enough along, the market really hasn't evolved to accept it, and it often takes longer to basically get things going. So. I think I just came out of those experience a little bit sort of reluctant. And I think the other thing in Hawaii was is that, you know, this was sort of the middle of 2008, kind of the middle of the height of the 221 era. And right. so I was sort of a little nervous about that. I've, you know, talked to people about it. And there was a lot in Hawaii like, hey, you got to be a $100 million company. If you're not going to go after $100 million, you're Don't not nothing. Right. So there was a reluctance to basically get involved with that. Um, and for me, basically, it started as a programming experiment. Mm -hmm. And so I think you know, a lot of sort of good companies start out that way that's sort of something that you're interested in solving practically, and it just sort of grows as you get positive feedback from the community. Okay, did you take any external capital whatsoever? No, no, just basically, yeah, I mean, it's, you know, these, are, these are websites, right? I mean, it's, right. you know, we've talked about this before. I use Ruby on Rails, and it's basically, you know, hosted on a virtual, you know, virtual hosting facility, right? So it's, you know, $50, $100 a month. So these things are, you know, very low cost. As long as you know how to program and you know basically something about the domain you're covering, mm -hmm. there's not a lot of cost um, to get up and going. Did, were you ever at a point where you, you hit a rough patch and you thought it'd be nice to have some extra capital to try a different approach or? No, I think, you know, the first couple of months, because it started out as a programming project, basically what I did is I did a spider to, and say, you know, people spiders is a trivial thing in terms right. of programming. But what I said is, well, well, what if I did a spider that actually looked for new web pages on companies' websites? Mm -hmm. Because I'm interested in information just in the companies in my domain. And so I started getting lots of interesting information, right? I would uncover sort of new releases, changes in strategy, things like that. So I pushed it out there and basically people said, wow, this is really interesting and more and more people came. Mm -hmm. And then, but after about six months, it became a point where like, okay, I'm doing this full time. I've got 10,000, 15,000 people a month coming to the site, but I'm not making any money off of it. Right. So at that point I was like, well, I've got to do something. Mm -hmm. um, so there one route could have been like, I could have went to you know, an angel and said, listen, I've got you know, 10,000 people coming and they're all sort of highly qualified people and whatever, if you give me money, I'll figure out to do advertisements or something. Mm -hmm. Instead, um, just one day I said like, it was right after Thanksgiving, I said, you know what? I'm gonna try to bundle some of the stuff that I've sort of written and some of the information I pulled together and I'm gonna just try to sell it. Mm -hmm. And so I think I sold it for $40 uh, per sort of person. 
and I did like a PayPal link or something trivial and I said like, I've aggregated all of our research and you know, will you pay me $40 for it? And I think the first day we had maybe 100, but over 50 and it was like thousands of dollars. Like I think it was nearly $3,000 the first day and 10,000 the first week. And I was like, wow, okay, I, I guess people will pay for this. And so- And it was a monthly thing, it's a subscription. First it was just basically I sold an individual report. And then I said okay. to myself, well, people are willing to pay $40 for a one-time report I wonder if people would pay $100 or $200 a year. So that was sort of step two. So the next month I said, okay, you guys seem to want to pay a one-time fee. I'm going to start basically a membership service. Um, you know, this is again, it's in, it, it, end of 2008. Right now I think it's become more accepted, but then it was like people started paying and it sort of more people signed up. So um, it's been, you know, relatively, there's been ups and downs in terms of figuring out, you know, what to publish and how to build a company. Uh, but it's just continuously been been funded by membership payments. It's just bootstrapped com completely on yeah, that. Yeah, completely bootstrapped. Yeah. And um, so where are you today in terms of number of customers? Uh, you have some employees now? So we've got uh, we've got about 3,000 paying members from about over 90 countries. That's amazing. Uh, we've got dozens of Fortune 500s. We have um, cities, airports, uh, military commands, so on and so forth, both in the United States and internationally. And you have tiered membership now. You have some sort of enterprise. Yeah, you know, it's basically, right? it's, you know, it's simple. It's anything from 100 to $500 a year. Okay. So, you know, when you look at basically for these businesses that are wanting to make decisions on video surveillance, right, it's mm -hmm. like, well, you know, for $500, I'm spending, you know, 100000 on video surveillance this year. What's $500? Mm -hmm. um, so I think it's, it's really easy for them, and it's all done online, right? So it's, it's a, it works well for Hawaii, right? Because I don't need to visit these people. They don't expect right. to come sort of talk to me. You know, they exchange emails, and I might mm -hmm. give them some advice, but it's totally something that it doesn't matter where I am. I could be in an igloo. I, you know, I could right. be basically, in a cave you know, somewhere. in a so. cave. It, it doesn't matter to the people as long as they get the information on the internet. And is your membership growth, is, is it sort of linear? Is it... Uh, are we seeing sort of a curve? Um, I think it's linear. Okay. You know, it's been it's been pretty steady sort of throughout. We basically have a very low unsubscription rate, which is okay. good. Um, but then you know, we don't have any direct competitors, right? Mm -hmm. So it's that that helps. Um, and people keep on signing up as they find it online. It's been really interesting to see. We had a subscriber from Zimbabwe today. I have no idea how basically people find it, but you know, Zimbabwe to Hawaii, sort of, you know, it's it's always a kind of a, a neat aspect of it. So that yeah, that was my next question. Your technique for new members, you know, new member acquisition. Are you are you promoting on social media? Are you how are you? Finding people, or are they all just finding you through good SEO? I, I don't have really any marketing techniques. I mean, there's basically, so there's about three or four of us, and none of us are in marketing. We're all basically doing sort of engineering, testing, you know, basically that that type of work. So there's nobody yeah. does any anything in marketing. Uh, I have an active Twitter account. Okay. Uh, but, you know, in our in our industry, like, I have, like, 1,200 Twitter followers, which is actually a lot for my industry, but tiny for sort of, you know, sure. for real sort of, you know, IT or social media types. But right. that's a little bit. I think it keeps in touch with sort of the core audience. Audience, but um, it's mostly, you know, people find it the word of mouth, they do a Google search. Uh, the mailing list has been sort of the most important thing for us, our email list. We've okay. got uh, over 20,000 people on our email list, so that that's helpful. So twice a week we'll send out an email saying, this is what's new in the industry, this is the new research that we're doing. Um, so that's been sort of our... You know, if we want to call it a marketing thing, that's been our so most important marketing technique. So, have you uh, any sort of referral programs where people get discounts for bringing people in? Anything yeah, haven't like that? haven't done anything like that. Um, but but maybe I think you know it's, it's something that's sort of you know worth doing. I mean, for the most part, you know, we've been looking at you know we've gone from sort of saying the industry had no good information on technology. All mm -hmm. of it was basically you know, what vendor said. This vendor said their product is really good and I'm going to republish that. And so we've basically said, like, listen, we need to change this model. We need to put independent information about how things really work. Mm -hmm. So that's still basically, you know, even, you know, in our third year now, still absolutely our focus is basically getting higher quality information. So, you know, maybe we'll do CO, maybe we'll do other things in the future, but still so far the, the most important element for me and for, you know, for our small team mm -hmm. is just better quality information, richer, broader information on the industry. Okay. And did you, so if I followed your timeline correctly, you're what, like kind of 18 months from basically zero to where you are now? Or? I think we're you know, about 24 months. I think it was January or 20, 27 months now, yeah. Okay. So we basically started charging out. And your growth is such you think you'll be a third or a half larger in a year in terms of total members or revenue? Uh, I think, you know, we'll will double or, you know, be up 50% to 100% in the next year. I think that that's fairly easy. I think we're easily going to be over 100% from last year. I mean, we're, you know, we're in the now half million dollar revenue range. And I think, okay. you know, we'll be approaching a million dollars in revenue soon enough. 
that yeah, that's amazing. So in, in terms of, I assume as you're getting more people in, you're wanting to do more of you use, you're gonna want more people. Is that a challenge, the scaling on the people side? I think the thing that we found is it's a little bit like sort of like actors, right? Like, okay. you know, there's Hugh Jackman and there's four mediocre actors and four mediocre actors isn't better than Hugh Jackman, right? right. So I think the same way you look in software development, right? Like, do you want four monkeys or do you want one guy who's a super really good software developer, right? right? You want sort of We've one super programmer. And so since basically our whole pitch is, you know, we are sort of the world's experts in either surveillance or security, having guys who sort of no surveillance doesn't really help us because right. people who are sophisticated will say, well, this guy doesn't know what he's talking about. Right. I'm not going to pay for hacks. To right. Tell me, yeah. <laughs> you know, to tell me stuff that I could sort of, you know, whatever, get Google. an advertisement. Right. So yeah. that's been the, that's been a, a key challenge. One interesting thing that I, I found out that I didn't suspect was that we've been finding really good people who comment on our site. So, I mean, and it makes oh, okay. some sense in, in some sense, right, that basically people who really like video surveillance will go to a site about video surveillance and will comment Com on the site. And some of the, you know, the you know, one or two guys we've hired most recently, they've been our best commenters, right? And they've been That's really insightful technique. commenters. And yeah. it was like, well, you're really good. You read all our stuff. You comment. You give us essentially free comment, uh, free content, right? Why Good don't job. you just come and work for us? Um, so that that's worked out well. And are um, you bringing are you bringing those people to Hawaii, or they're working remotely? So there are a couple of guys in Hawaii. So there's basically three of us in Hawaii, okay. but then you know other people are going to be outside of Hawaii. Okay. Some of the things like we do tests, like we'll do all our testing here in Hawaii because physically, when you're doing a product test, you uh -huh. kind of want to be all together. But a lot of the things is sort of analysis and basically um, either financial or technology analysis, and that that can be done from anywhere. Okay. And your goal isn't to be acquired in a year. Your goal is to have organic growth and build up a substantial company. Is that yeah? I mean, of... I mean, I think the the most important goal for for me, as I've said before, is just basically better quality information. I think it'll all work itself out mm -hmm. as long as basically we can keep on raising the bar for the level of information in the industry. You know, beyond that, I don't really see any limits. I mean, I think we can easily do five to ten million dollars a year in revenue, which you know, thirty percent net margins, because you know these businesses are quite scalable, right? right. It's recurring monthly revenue. You know, you don't basically need to hire a new guy each time you have, you know, another hundred customers. Okay. Um, so, so yeah, so I mean, that's the big thing. Quality information leads to basically a better business and we can apply it to other markets. Absolutely. So, our, so do you feel that your business is an anomaly or do you think that some of the businesses that were funded in Hawaii during the time when technology companies were getting funding may have done better if they were a little leaner? I know that's kind of a loaded question. Yeah, I mean, I, so I think part of the challenge is they've seen is that, you know, when you look at basically startups in general, a certain percentage of startups are, are dreamers and don't know what they're doing, right? Mm -hmm. It's not, there's nothing unique to Hawaii, right? There are dreamers in Philadelphia. There are dreamers sure. in Menlo Park. There are dreamers in, in, in Hawaii. Sure. Um, I, it struck me just sort of as an outsider view, basically, mm -hmm. that there was quite a number of dreamers in Hawaii. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, you know, 221, and as we said earlier, right, even basically from the Valley, that, you know, easy money helps dreamers make bad decisions. Um, so, I, you know, that's basically been my experience, not in Hawaii, because I've never done sort of, you know, a technology startup in Hawaii, in but I think the same principles would apply here. And so we're being an outsider. Mm -hmm. That's what it struck me that, like, these guys were doing, you know, silly things that, like, couldn't ever make $100 million. And we're doing it in a way where they wasted a lot of money. Um, so I don't know, I, mean, I think the other thing that I learned was that it's really important to be a domain expert first. And I think you have the same thing, right, in your business, right, is that you don't just start saying, like, you know what, you know, I'm going to go into this sort of technology stack that I have no experience in, right? right? Like, it's just, that's kind of a crazy thing to do. But you see that a lot in startups. People are like, yeah. oh, you know, I was sitting around my house yesterday and, you know, plumbing seems to be a really good thing. And it's like, well, you know anything about plumbing? No, but, you know, I, there's, I have an idea about sort of doing plumbing or, you know, <laughs> you know, these types right. of things. So I think that's the challenge. You know, in Hawaii, like, there, I think there are some things that we should be better at, even things like, you know, when we were, we've talked about this before, mm -hmm. the, like, uh, when I was previously doing things involved surfing, right? Hawaii should dominate the market for basically internet technology for surfing, right? Sure. We do have competitive Ocean advantage, sports, right? diving, surfing. You know, things like that. Yeah. And so, um, so I think they're basically, I think it's been disappointing. I personally feel, again, as an outsider, mm -hmm. that, uh, that 221 was a net negative and sort of reinforcing bad habits. Um, but, you know, will it be better for them to do lean startups? You know, I, I don't know. Do you think that 
lean startups, uh, that there's sort of a, a good Darwinian dynamic that comes into play when you're, um, you have people and they're dealing with very limited money and it's sort of a sink or swim thing where you can't, uh, you can't really float for any period of time. If what your idea isn't working, you're dead pretty quick. I think so. I mean, I'm not sure, you know, I, I, in terms of Darwinian type thinking, but I, I do think it yeah. keeps you more grounded, right? And whether that's Darwinian or not, right, is that it forces you to generate revenue, right? Mm -hmm. It forces you, and I think the good thing about generating revenue is that you figure out your business model, which mm -hmm. seems to a lot of companies never figure out a business model. It's like, well, what's your business model? Oh, I'm going to sell advertisements eventually. Right. Oh, really? And how many advertisements are you going to sell? And mm -hmm. how many people will come? So I think, you know, the the big money, basically, without that big money, it does, like for me, right, it mm -hmm. forced me to say, okay, how am I going to make money off this? Mm -hmm. So the making money off thing, I think, was really important. And then basically figuring out a strategy to basically to build your business uh, organically, I think that does help. I mean, you look at basically things, whether it's Walmart or Facebook, right, none of these companies started out as basically saying, like, oh, I'm going to be the biggest retailer in the whole world, right? Sam Walton right. didn't say that, right? He'd get and, left out of the room. <laughs> you know, right? And Zuckerberg didn't say he was going to be sort of the social network that connected the globe, right? right. It was like for college students, you know, et cetera. So I do think there's a lot of virtues of basically solving a real problem first mm -hmm. and then solving, you know, ex expanding on that real problem and solving other real problems rather mm -hmm. than, uh, you know, spending your time talking about some sort of imaginary thing that, you know, dream that you have. Okay. What if you had been, so you're kind of in an interesting position because you had uh, business acumen and programming capabilities. Is that the reason you were able to do what you did? Is, or is that not repeatable unless you have both of those skills? Um, I think, you know, you, we talk about this and like, you know, yeah. tech guys basically, <laughs> tech guys can pick up business skills better than business guys can pick up tech skills. I think we agree on that. Right? I, I'm biased right. in agreeing with you on that, so, but yes, I would so, agree. So I think, you know, <laughs> So business guys, one thing I've always seen, like, and the one pattern I learned is like, okay, any company founded mm. by a pure business guy who needs to, to bring in sort of his engineer, uh -huh. that's a risky company. Harder time. Right, yeah. because it's, it's a lot more expensive. Because the business guy, right, the business guy thinks he's worth $100,000 a year, right? Mm -hmm. And good for him. Maybe he's worth $100,000 a year sure. in a startup. Uh, but it makes it much harder to achieve. I think when you look at basically building a product, because basically I was the business guy mm -hmm. and I was the, the, the engineer, mm -hmm. I was able to iterate on the product much quicker, right? Sure. We didn't have to have committee meetings. I didn't need to call some guy in India and say like, hey, like, can this be done? Mm -hmm. Like one thing we did, we built it in a series of like four weeks. Mm -hmm. We built this tool basically to find cameras and it was basically, we'd use this 40 different criteria mm -hmm. and it sort of searches a database based on different criteria of cameras and it pulls out over you know 600 cameras, which cameras match any co combination of those 40 criteria. Mm -hmm. And that's been a really big hit. It was sort of our biggest hit at the end of last year. And it was something basically that I sort of designed and sort of programmed sort of by myself. Some mm -hmm. of the guys helped in QAing and whatnot, but it wasn't like I didn't go and say like, hey, I need a couple bids and I need to do change orders and mm -hmm. it comes back and yeah. it's tens of thousands of dollars and it's not right. And you know, if I needed to make a change, I just made it. Sure. Um, so I do think basically having that combination or at least having the fundamental te technical skills Mm -hmm. uh, are critical, to, you know, to leading startups. And I think, you know, when you look in the mainland, right, that's now accepted Bible, right? I mean, it is. You know, yeah. I mean, who's, which which bi from, which from, MBAs from Bill Gates down to all the new social networking companies? They and you really look all, all the incubators, yeah. right? Are the incubators hi hiring two guys with you know accounting degrees? Like, oh, don't worry about it. you don't know how to program. <laughs> right, right. You, no. you know, you can no. you can file a tax return, right? No, huh, yeah. that would be crazy. Um, so I that's think true. that's kind of, that's settled. Whether it's settled in Hawaii, I don't know, but sort of in the rest of the U.S., it seems to be the case. Do you think that Hawaii suffers from a, um, you know, what in Japan they call the Galapagos syndrome a bit, where we are very inward facing and we don't look to see what was successful in other places and simply take those best ideas? Do well, we suffer from that? I think you, you think? would know better than I would. Um, and since you're asking that question, there may be some sort of hints of, you know, truth in that. Uh, but I, I don't, I mean, I, I think there, there's something strange about it, right? Mm -hmm. and, and often, basically, when I would, you know, go to sort of these technology meetups, I'd get a strange feeling like, well, you guys sort of don't understand how some of these things work. Um, so right. there's something there. Mm -hmm. um, but I think it's hard in general, right? You know, I think you know, looking at my experiences in New York and the Valley, it helped a lot, not in terms of just the good things, right? It's not like mm -hmm. everything in sort of, you know, the mainland or everything in Silicon Valley is correct. Mm -hmm. Some things go horribly wrong. Mm -hmm. But there are, there are lessons that you learn when things go horribly long. You take those lessons with you. Sometimes they're even more painful, right? And you mm -hmm. say, like, well, 
we try this and we know this was a disaster, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I think there is a little bit of just in terms of lack of experience, you've got to get those types of reps. And you know, when you've got those incubators, right, you've got, you know, you've got Paul Graham or whoever basically helping you, giving you that experience that you don't have. And, mm -hmm. you know, maybe you don't have that sort of same sort of thing in Hawaii because you don't have either enough reps or you don't have enough sort of mentorship of people who've been through that. So, I mean, I, those things certainly, uh, I would suspect would be impactful. Okay. And, you know, there's been a lot of uh, activity in government recently. We've got a new administration. Various groups have created, for example, the High Tech Workforce Development Committee. Um, you had a tech caucus. Uh, they've renamed it, but it was, you know, something along those lines that was set up by um, Senator Fukunaga. Is there anything government can do to help companies like yours, or is the best thing they can do is sort of stay out of the way? What's your... Your feelings on I mean, all these efforts at the government level? I think, you know, I, I've kind of put it out of my mind. It's okay. not to say basically, like, I'm not appreciative or I wouldn't want it, but it mm -hmm. seems to be, it's like most of sort of the things that make my business successful is going to be me sort of making the right decisions. Right. I don't think the state of Hawaii is Can really holding you. me back. Right? I don't think they're basically like, oh, it's, it's you know, if I fail, I'm not going to say, wow, it's, it's, you know, it's the governor's fault, right? <laughs> right. Like, you know, it's, if it fails, it's my fault, right? Mm -hmm. So, uh, and if it succeeds or basically they can help it succeed, I don't know. I mean, I'm sure there are things that can be done, I think. But more importantly, if you look at basically what are the elements that makes a good startup, mm -hmm. I think whatever the government can do is really still at the margins. I think yeah. more fundamentally is, you know, does is the entrepreneur good at technology? Mm -hmm. Does the entrepreneur know basically how to run a startup? Right. right. Those things are, are really hard to do, take experience, and it's not something that the government can basically, the government can't give me a million dollar check and make me sort of do that, right, or make me understand that, right? Those sort of understanding, I don't think that some, the government or anyone can buy. Okay. Do you think that, that Hawaii imposes any sort of limits, any sort of ceiling? Can you, in Hawaii, grow this business to be a $20 million business in five years or a $50 million business in 10 years? Or will well, Hawaii stop you at So some I think, point? you know, there are, yeah. there are certain limits, not necessarily for my business, but mm -hmm. I think when I looked basically in forming the business, certainly some of the steps that I made mm -hmm. were done to basically to recognize sort of Hawaii's remoteness, right? Mm -hmm. I don't sell any physical products, right? I've never basically looked at basically selling any physical products or basically doing anything with an enterprise sales force. Because I said, those types of things are very difficult to do running out of Hawaii, right? Because if you, the, the travel cost, the coordination cost is just a lot more expensive. And mm -hmm. so I think intrinsically, I've already factored that in. So listen, okay. this is gonna be a purely internet business. Mm -hmm. People will pay with their credit cards online. Mm -hmm. If they need support, they'll call me or they'll email me, but it's not gonna be based on me sort of traveling to Kansas City or Dallas and pitch people mm -hmm. on buying, you know, a $10,000 product. Um, so sure, I, I think basically it's certainly not the government's fault, right? It's mm -hmm. just, you know, it is what it is. We're an island X thousands of miles away uh, from other major markets. And so that's to me why it's so important to basically focus on internet sales because okay. internet sales overcomes that type of thing. People, people know that I'm in Hawaii and so and probably the, the worst thing that they'll do is sort of make Mai Tai jokes. I mean, literally, basically, sure. you know, once a week, someone say, hey. Are you on the beach yeah, with a Mai Tai, tai one hand tai, and your laptop blah, 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 and the right? other? So, I mean, you know, you get that type of thing, <laughs> right. right? But of course. beyond that, it doesn't really matter to them, right? Because I'm not selling something that requires high touch. Right. Um, so I think that that's one of the big things. High touch businesses are difficult to run in Hawaii. But low touch businesses that are primarily driven by the internet I think that works well for a while. The other thing that's interesting for us is that being far away actually keeps us separate. Because part of our business is to be independent and to do you know, real information, real mm -hmm. reviews, being an honest broker, being away keeps us away from them, right? There's, there's sort right. of a natural barrier. Like, I, even if I wanted to, I can't go out for lunch and drinks with a vendor unless they want to travel X thousand miles away, And, and right? you kind of like that. Yeah, oh, I like that, definitely. I, I right. like sort of basically, you know, very rarely will they say it and basically I can easily play it off. Like, listen, there's no point you coming here. I don't have the time. You don't want to come here. Right. So actually, to me, that that's actually a net plus that there's a little bit of isolation <laughs> removed basically from something right. that I feel is sort of a corrupt practice. That's really interesting, uh, a reversal of the tr traditional sort of uh, view that the isolation is, uh, is uh, to your detriment. Sure. You view it as being I mean, an advantage for, because for a lot of things, a lot isolation of kind of BS is detrimental, right? right? But if you're basically trying to do something different and mm -hmm. trying to isolate yourself from something that you think is a fundamentally bad or corrupt practice, mm -hmm. there are benefits to basically being away from that. To not having to take guys out for beers to get their business or, right. you know. 
That's really interesting. What do you think about it? Have you been following, you know, there's a lot of activity. Uh, you know, we've got quite a puka in the budget, and now it's a much going to be a much larger one with the new budget. And so we see a lot of creative taxation efforts going on with um, Choi putting forward this extension of the G tax to, to interstate commerce. Uh, we had the affiliate tax, which uh, initially came up last year with uh, House Bill 1405 that was going to tax affiliate networks. And Amazon said, well, we're going to drop Hawaii. And um, and then Lingo ended up vetoing it, but it's been resurrected uh, a couple times. There's been a couple bills that attempted to resurrect it. So does it concern you that there are all these efforts to try to tax internet businesses and internet transactions in sort of special and exotic ways, in ways that uh, in some cases are unique to Hawaii or unique to Hawaii in a small group of states? Well, I think one thing because of the nature of business, is, again, since we don't, we're not reselling products, our margin structure is so high. Right. So I mean, basically, you, you know, take a hit our, on our margin structure is whatever. You know, we pay for credit card transactions. So right. It's ninety-seven percent margin. We pay for servers or whatever. But you know, the, the gross margins are so high that it basically it doesn't. I mean, it would basically be sure. Do you want to pay more money? No. Mm-hmm. But um, it doesn't structurally or strategically sort of wreck the business. So I'm just speaking sort of personally for my company. Right. The impact would be a lot less than basically if I was reselling, you know, cameras or reselling right. printers. Right. Like it could be destructive to the business or whatnot. Um, but for me, basically, it doesn't have really as much sort of a, an impact. Okay. If it happens, it happens. Um, those things are beyond my control, right? So I'm sure. Not, so it's not a, not really going to sort of you know spend much sleep, time sort of worrying about, about that. Um, do you see that you're do you it, will the subscription model? Do you feel be the the sole revenue source you're going to concentrate on? Will you ever have a lightweight free version with advertising or introduce other models? So, I mean, we're for, first of all, we are a freemium site. I mean, okay. we've been freemium from the beginning in the sense that, you know, about 20 to 30 percent of our content is free. And even okay. our free stuff is the, is the best in the world in our domain. And that's um, what people find, you think, often through Google? I think so. The, I think basically what Google people will do is basically, for instance, we have a free book. We have a 76 mm-hmm. page ebook. Right? And people can download the ebook and sort of that sort of, even the ebook, right, which is free, is sort of better than anything they could get in sort of trade magazines or things like that. So we already give a lot of free things away. And that's basically a form of marketing, right? So people look at the free stuff and they say, well, these guys are pretty smart. They're pretty honest. They're basically mm-hmm. they're willing to go and to you know attack people who are the big players in the space. They're willing to take a stand for users. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, all of that free content to us, I guess, in some sense, in a in a business sense, that is a form of marketing for us, right? Because that's something we could have otherwise sold. Sure. Um, so yeah. So I mean, we, we definitely do that. So in terms of tiers, and we certainly have free, and then we have our different sort of subscription tiers. Mm-hmm. There's, there are other things that we can do. I mean, there's easily things like we could do events. Like we know basically we had an event, we could charge a thousand dollars per person and we could get you know 50 100 150 people there so there's easily things that we could expand to do I mean there's other things like we could do phone consultations which we haven't touched mainly mm-hmm. because I'm more focused on terms of building the core research than doing re- than doing consulting for individual companies and we get that a lot from you know even from fortune 500 companies who are like hey I'm deploying a new large-scale system mm-hmm. for my you know warehouses across the country can you help us and it's like well I'd love to help you, and I'm sure you'd be willing to pay us good money, but Mm -hmm. if I do that, then I'm cutting back on what I'm doing on sort of the core site. Have you looked at micro-consulting, where basically if they're reading an article and they want to have a 10 or 15-minute conversation, you know, for 100 bucks, uh, they can click to do that? Yeah, I think the thing is basically, like I said in the beginning, they're still basically such a small team, right? Mm -hmm. And a lot of people want to micro-consult with me. Which is challenging because, <laughs> right. you know, I'm the, the head of the company, the researcher, the programmer, right, right. the cook. So you're right? maxed out. So, so I, you know, that, that $100 basically probably strategically doesn't make a lot of sense. Okay. But I think as the company grows, yeah, ab- absolutely, certainly the ability to basically give sort of additional customized advice, mm-hmm. um, certainly there's revenue opportunity there. So, no, I, I definitely think, you know, there's lots of other opportunity. The reality is, is that the core subscription business is still growing at such a fast rate Mm -hmm. that I don't really need to worry about sort of incremental revenue right now, right? I'd be, you know, it's growing at a fast enough rate. I want to continue basically to increase the quality of the core research. Mm -hmm. And, you know, maybe in year five, right, when we have, you know, seven people, maybe you can start doing things like that and there's incremental revenue. But for now, you know, secondary. Okay. So uh, with our uh, last minute here, I wanted to ask you, abstract it a little bit. So uh, do you feel that your type of company is the main type of company we should be looking at and that people should be trying to start? If we're looking at Hawaii and the, the startup community in Hawaii, are there other types of companies that you feel make sense in Hawaii? What kind of startups should we be should we be creating in Hawaii? So that, that's, that's obviously beyond sort of my expertise in terms of, you know, <laughs> what should be done. I have a couple of things I would say in terms of Hawaii. Mm-hmm. 
the you know selling things online or selling information online i do think is a really good play for hawaii mm -hmm. and that could be applied to lots of different things whether it's information on you know thermal or information on you know ocean or other different types of things mm -hmm. uh, anything that basically is low touch i think is a is a good sort of model for hawaii where you're not actually having to physically meet with people okay so i do think you know relative to you know all the dual use and military focus people make i'm sure people make lots of money there mm -hmm. but there is certainly an opportunity for a different class of startup, right? Mm -hmm. To basically do things that are more information driven, that are more web driven, that are more cloud driven. Uh, I certainly think all of those have a better chance of succeeding relative traditionally where 10 years ago you were selling a big software license or right. big product sales. So I think that's one sort of niche. There's certainly other elements and basically different ways why I can be successful. But I do think sort of that model of basically selling information or selling sort of, you know, online services is basically something Hawaii should attack more, at least some entrepreneurs in Hawaii. Okay. And do you think you could have done this 10 years ago, before cloud computing, when you would have had to no. buy your own servers and, no? No. I don't so know. That's, that's kind of an amazing thing that cloud computing and all these utility-based services have enabled people to do something like what you're doing. Yeah. I think it's not, just, it's not just a, with, with the, no the, the component side, right? It's yeah. basically that there's so many more people on the internet, right? Versus 10 years ago, and people are much more comfortable right. using the internet. And video is right. We do, we do videos, and we do all types of sort of video screencasts, and you wouldn't be able to easily do that 10 years ago. So I think there's a lot more people there, and the technology stacks are much cheaper and much more robust. Uh, so that combination now, you look 10 years from now, right? 10 mm -hmm. years from now, I think the technology stacks will be available will even make it more powerful to do things from Hawaii. That sort of death of distance concept, I think that, you know, that really is in play, and I think that will continue to help Hawaii. So that's pretty important when you're on the most isolated island chain in the world. All right, so, you know, if we look at Hawaii over the past, you know, you know really we started to see kind of um, in, in mid-2008, there started to be some, some rumbling, some trouble. Um, we had uh, essentially Lingle talking about or implying that she wouldn't veto a... a um, uh, basically an amendment or a, a, a peeling back of 221. Um, some, some uncertainty was introduced into the market. Um, in 2009, tech investment dove, and it was there was virtually none in 2010, except for in some very specific markets. So um, do you think that there's, you know, looking at which companies have sort of survived that and which ones didn't, that there are categories of companies that have emerged um, that survived that we now know maybe these are the kinds of companies that will survive in Hawaii because they made it through that kind of trial period, not just with 221, but the, you know, basically Western financial markets completely collapsing, you know, all these things that happened in 2009 and 2010. Well, I think that the challenging thing it looks like, and Dan, you know this better than me, that at least in sort of the, the sort of called the internet technology, the web technology space, it seems Hawaii didn't come through terribly well in that segment. No, I would agree with that. <laughs> so I'm not sure in terms of, I mean, nationally mm -hmm. we can basically look for patterns in terms of what succeeded sure um but from hawaii i mean what's the patterns of success i don't know i mean there are a couple of companies that sort of made it moved mm -hmm. and then the companies that were here seems to be either out or down or hibernation or sure um but I think, you know, when we look at basically, and even look in sort of the Ruby and Rails community, right, there's this thing about sort of, you know, bootstrap startups and basically, you know, the, not just the lean approach, mm -hmm. but basically people have built companies that are doing hundreds of thousands or a few million dollars of revenue who are doing sort of real services. Like, uh -huh. if you look at in terms of, and I'm sure you do the same, like in terms of services that, that are used, right, like I use things like... Uh, like, you know, in terms of what for mailing list management or email management or uh, monitoring servers or basically monitoring applications. Mm -hmm. These are all services I pay anywhere from 10 to, you know, $100 a month, a month right? right? And the, these these companies are not bigger than companies like us, right? Like, you know, they're doing, you know, hundreds of thousands or a few millions, but they're not monster companies. Right. But they're profitable, right? And so right. They've, they've, they've gone after these sort of, you know, niches that are not terribly sexy outside mm -hmm. of the tech space. People don't say like, oh my God, like an, an exception tracking service is really sexy right mm -hmm. but those guys basically people like us are paying them 10 20 30 dollars a month and they're getting thousands or maybe tens of thousands of people around the world sure. who are paying them for that so i think that's one model of success uh, i don't think that that's a model that's really been tried enough in hawaii to that's actually true. ask people to pay me money um so i think you know that's clearly across you know the, the u.s mainland mm -hmm. proved out as being sort of a way to build a viable tech sector or basically viable tech businesses. Sure. I guess I've seen it. We've seen a few with Unfuddled, I guess, the project management software. Are you familiar with those guys? Um, Hawaii? Or yeah, they were okay. actually in Hawaii. Yeah. I didn't realize that until I ran into one at a um, an event that was put together by the, the Chimp folks. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So that, 
you know, that's pretty interesting. Hmm. So I, they kind of reminded me of you in that it was a couple guys that had thrown together something, right, right, right. you know, working in their garage or living room or whatever. Right. And um, and I know people all over the mainland that were using their service for something in that price right. range, you know, the 20 to 100 a month kind of price range. So I agree. That is a good business model for Hawaii. And then, of course, we see renewables and we do see money that's coming in. And a lot of it's money from the federal government with oil prices going up and unrest in the Middle East. We see, you know, the algae biofuel companies and we have, uh, you know, a few of those in Hawaii getting large grants. And that's quite a very different funding model. Right. The the energy guys, of course, um, they can't they can't do what we can do out of our living room. You know, sometimes uh, you need one hundred million dollars to put put together a plant or a project based thing. Um, so yeah, I think it's interesting that we've seen, we've seen, we've seen growth in some of the lean guys like you, and we're starting to see some companies like that coming to the Manoa Innovation Center. Um, uh, you know, there's a company that's coming that's doing, um, online training to help teachers learn how to work with children that have learning disabilities in their classroom. And it's a whole bunch of videos, um, basically people with expertise in that field and they've got customers out on the East coast. Yeah. I think think, that type of thing, the latter part you uh mentioned, I think fits more in terms of on on the website, right? Mm -hmm. But I think one thing when before, you know, in terms of the contracting part Mm and contracting with government and even before, basically before I, there was a time before when I was in Hawaii where I worked for sort of a defense contractor, essentially. Right. And so basically, we were basically launching some spin-off products based on what we were doing for the government, trying to go into the commercial sector. But mm-hmm. the pattern that I've seen there is that I, I think it's quite hard to basically take what you get grants for from the government and actually build commercial products, especially the way sort of the web built, the web is built right now and sort of the types of sort of classes of products that are basically being adopted, going from basically things that you design from the government and then basically selling it to small businesses or medium-sized businesses. I question how much, how well that works. It doesn't mean it's bad for Hawaii, right? Like right. Hawaii certainly, right, basically the federal government, the military is an important element of the economy. Right. Uh, whether or not basically that's a good model to use the dual use sector and spinning that off, I actually saw on PBN not too long ago that there was some defense contractor that wanted to get into like the home surveillance market. And yes. I read the article and I was like, oh, and he's like, well, no one's doing anything like this. And I'm like, well, <laughs> there's there's a half dozen people doing exactly like this, basically, mm-hmm. and they're much farther along. So, so I don't know. I mean, I think those types of things, that worries me in terms of not because it could be good businesses in, in itself, mm-hmm. but is it basically a good foundation to launch basically commercial businesses? Mm-hmm. That I think is much, much riskier. I, I, you know, it seems like it's been necessitated because you had a lot of these dual use companies that were being funded through, um, you know, it's fe- federal dollars, through right. various channels come in, whether they're SBIRs or all the different sorts of um federal funding structures that exist. And uh, they thought that was going to continue at least through till 2012 with the omnibus bill. And then the, the Republicans came in and basically stopped that. So a, a lot of funding that was going to dual use companies, basically the spigot's been turned off right. in the past few months in Hawaii. And so it seems like they're, now their survival strategy is to become more commercial. Or maybe they were 80-20. Now they need to be the reverse. They need to be 80% commercial, and there's kind of a scramble to do that. I think that's that. really, really tough to execute. Uh, just, you know, going from one to the other. Because the things that the government wants often is basically, they just don't match with what consumers want, right? It's basically become so much overbuilt, and you bring it to a consumer market or a commercial market, and they're like, why would you need these 58 different features, right? right. The government, you know, finds to be essential. And it's not like the government's wasteful in, in many respects. It's just uh-huh. that they have more demanding requirements, right? Things that are in a military application, even even in our domain, right? And, like, yeah. the, those types of things, like, if you put in a general commercial market, you'd be like, well, I, I don't need these these 10 features. Where in a military, where basically this might be deployed in a war effort, right? You right. do need these things. Right. Um, so I think that transfer is, is really difficult. That doesn't mean, again, that basically it isn't worth doing, but if that's going to be the source of commercial sort of entrepreneurship, Entrepreneurship, that I think is basically a, a low one. risk or a tougher one in terms yeah. of succeeding. Yeah, I, I, I agree it's a tough transition. Um, it always helps if you have lots of smart people. So I think some of the ones that are leaner and have good groups of, of smart engineers working there um, you know, might be able to pull that off. But, but I, I think agree, it gets tough... back to the other issue, right? You've got these sort of big products, right? Mm-hmm. And you want to sell these products cost, you know, let's say 10000 100000 $500,000. Okay, you want to sell this to people, right? Right. Now you want to sell this to people in Denver, Kansas City, and Jacksonville. Right. Okay, you're going to sell something for $100,000 to someone in Denver? Well, that person in Denver is going to want to meet you. Right. I mean, the person is not going to buy a hundred thousand dollar product basically <laughs> with this credit card online, right? That's right. just not going to happen, right? So then you say, like, okay, do I hire salespeople in Honolulu and do I send them to Denver? 
right. okay, it's a thousand dollars per ticket. It's it's you know twelve hours to get there. Blah 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 blah. It's multiple stops, et cetera, et cetera. So right. I think that you're back to basically the thing that we talked about earlier is that basically how do you sell um, these types of enterprise products from Honolulu, Firetide or Landmark when it was right is a good example. They're actually in in the market that basically I cover, mm -hmm. and right so they started here in Honolulu, right? I think just you know a few a few blocks down from here. Okay. But right, they moved basically to to, to to San Jose or to Santa Clara, and I think it's necessary for them, right? They now sell basically municipal surveillance projects throughout the United States and Korea and a few other countries, and oh. they've got like you know I think they have a half dozen or a dozen sort of enterprise salespeople, and mm -hmm. they're you know they're basically they're based in each of their regions, and I think that's absolutely essential. You can't mm -hmm. you can't do that as easily. For from Honolulu. So I think that's the other element when you go back to the dual use sector is like, mm -hmm. okay, you want to sell big ticket items, how are you going to do it from Honolulu? And, and how much will the cost add and how basically inconvenient will it be to negotiate these sort of personal deals, you know, so far away from your home office? What about, um, what do you think about the gaming sector? So that's an interesting one. You know, Hawaii obviously had one big home run with that, which was um, basically Hank Rogers with Tetris. Um, and you know, very smart guy, um, very hard worker. He used to be at the Manoa Innovation Center, um, you know, our, our corporate neighbor. Um, do you think that, and so I think a lot of people were kind of inspired by that, and we see a lot of little game companies that have kind of uh, have, have popped up in recent, in recent years. Do you think that that was a, a fluke, or do you think that gaming is a, a model that makes sense in Hawaii, interactive content and game companies? Uh, I have zero idea. I mean, I, I think I, <laughs> now my gut feel says uh -huh. it's, it's probably a fluke. doesn't mean you couldn't have another fluke. Uh -huh. um, but, you know, how you build businesses like that, I don't know. So, okay. Um, yeah. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> you know, just to be honest. You know. um, when you think about companies that have been successful in, in Hawaii, um, and, you know, we've got a few as we go back. You know, you look at Hank uh, with his company and Verifone and some of these others. Um, do you think that those businesses, uh, that it was in spite of Hawaii? Or do you think, and, and that they were kind of things that are, are worth, or do you think there's things that are worth studying and, and reproducing? So I'm not an expert in basically, and, you know, Hank's company, but it seems like basically that was you know, abnormal, right? Like, it's not something like, mm -hmm. what could you learn from it in terms of him negotiating the Tetris deal? I mean, again, I don't know the, the facts of the matter, but I saw sure. it on TV, like lots of other people, <laughs> right, right? right? He goes to Russia, right? So, right. you know, what lessons can I learn? I mean, it's amazing in terms of what he did, but it like, yeah. what could I, could I go to China? I mean, maybe I guess I could learn a lesson right. from there, right? So I, I think it's hard, basically, to use it as, as a template. So I think that's one of the challenging things on, on the tech sector side, you know, what are the good templates for sort of a young information technology or web mm. technology company, there aren't really good templates that I can use locally. And maybe I'm just okay. not aware of it, right? But I mean, you had to, for, you had to go back, what's the Verifone, 10 years ago? Yeah. Right? Uh, more, yeah. Something uh, more. like that, right? Yeah. It's been, been quite a while, right? Yeah. So uh, that that's one of the other challenges, right? What's our template? What's our mentor? What's our models in terms of, you know, doing it on the on the, on the the you know information tech side? Okay. So I, I'm going to ask you a hard question that I get a lot. Okay. When I go and I'm doing a, a lecture over at UH or you know, uh, Chaminade, these, these schools, I get students that are coming out of like the ICS program at, at UH and they say, uh, it's my senior year, I've got to figure out what I'm going to do. Um, should I stay in Hawaii and try and find an interesting company to work for? Should I try to do my own thing or should I head to the mainland? What do you tell them? Well, I think for anything, it, it depends on sort of, you know, what their sort of personality and ambitions are, et cetera. But let, sure. let, let's basically limit it to basically people who are really ambitious, right? Because yeah. if someone basically just wants to have a desk job, person. right, just go get a yeah. desk job wherever, right? right? But let's say basically this is someone who really wants to be an entrepreneur, basically really wants to do something sort of mm -hmm. different. Um, you know, for those types, I don't know. I mean, working – I mean, for me, basically, I'll give, to give the parallel, right? Mm -hmm. I, I came here to grad school uh, for – a short period, and then I then said, well, listen, I got to go back and get more experience. So what mm -hmm. I did basically over the last decade was go back and forth, back and forth to New York, to Florida, to, to, to San Francisco, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And I think it was absolutely essential. Like, I needed those stops. I could not basically just do it, just spend 10 years here and get to the same point that I would be now because – those reps, those experiences you get, there's just not enough of them that you can get purely in Hawaii. It's just a critical mass thing. You just got to be in a place where you've got a lot of other companies, a lot of other people, and you can test yourself against them. 
Uh, kind I of think that? tests are, you know, learn different types of lessons. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, I mean, even if you basically, if you could basically get into like, you know, even like three years ago, if you were one, one of the handful of companies that got, you know, two to $10 million of funding, mm -hmm. those probably were probably pretty good lessons, right? Mm -hmm. Even though most of those companies or all those companies failed, mm -hmm. you probably learned a lot about like, okay, we shouldn't basically screw around with prototypes or we shouldn't keep on, you know, slipping our, our, our deadlines or basically right. release dates. I mean, those are important things to learn a hammer home in your head mm -hmm. that like, like, you know, listen, you've got to meet these things, you've got to iterate, you've got mm -hmm. to get the product out, um, you know, burning money, things like that. So sure. I don't know if it's necessary that you have to sort of learn it uh, in basically in any one given place. But if but you're you going to be, leave and come back, if you're going to be yeah. trapped basically in sort of a, you know, a mid-level IT job or just sort of, you know, I don't think basically programming for like, even if you work for the best sort of defense contractor in Hawaii, mm -hmm. if you want to basically start up your own sort of web company, web mm -hmm. 2.0, whatever people call it these days, mm -hmm. that's bad reps for that type of business. And it's not because you don't do interesting technology work or because you're not smart or because it's basically not challenging. I'm sure mm -hmm. those things are quite challenging in many respects and in many leading edge technologies. But in terms of actually putting together a product, mm -hmm. it's a whole different basically thing when you're launching a product for commercial use, mm -hmm. right? Like the whole thing about like, I mean, basically, when I was younger, uh, one of our, my bosses, one of my job, he was a colonel, mm -hmm. or he was a former colonel, of course. And he basically he had this military mentality when it was always like sort of like policies and procedure and bureaucracy and, you know, he's the colonel and <laughs> I'm a staff sergeant, I guess, or something, <laughs> right? And it was just like, right. this, this doesn't work in this sort of, you know, like in the startup sector. Right. So I think, that, I mean, that's obviously extreme, right? And right. Not everyone's going to have a case like that. But there's certainly those types of flavors or characteristics do exist, basically, and are important when you're doing a billion-dollar project that people's lives depend on, mm. right? But, but a web startup, nobody's life really depends on it, right? Right. Um, so th the way you sort of approach it is different, and you need to get those types of reps. So I mean, that would be the bigger thing for me. If, if you're a younger guy or gal, that try to get reps in sort of companies that are actually building products for commercial use mm -hmm. because those things will come back to help you when you go and do it because you'll learn different lessons about you know what works and what doesn't work okay so i've got a you know i recently participated in in the uh, programmers workforce development group that was put together by various um, folks uh, in the administration and um we talked a lot about how hard it is to find people that are um, you know, the kind of very high-end developers, highly motivated, innovative people that, that create companies, that create companies that become significant. And, um, and, and also how those people are hard to find, you know, as those companies are growing, how it can be a limiting factor. So with your company, when we get out, uh, we get out five years and you've got, you know, you've got 30 people, let's say. Where, what, where do those people come from? Are those people people that are from Hawaii, left and came back? Are they people that you've pulled in from California? Um, are they people that come out of UH? You know, what is the makeup well, of Well, I that think workforce? for me, basically, just in the same sense that basically, I, because of the structure of the business, I don't mm. feel that Hawaii really blocks me that much. Okay. In the same sense, Hawaii basically isn't that critical in terms of where people work. I mentioned that earlier that, you know, if we have good people, like uh, one of our new guys basically is from Pennsylvania. Right. And it's like, well, I didn't strategically say, well, you know, north of Philadelphia is a really good place to have a really excellent person on the team. Sure. It worked out that way. And that's and that's perfectly fine. And so he's one of the commenters. On and your one side. of the commenters. Yeah. Right. Basically. And so, you know, if the next guy is basically, you know, in southwestern Minnesota, mm -hmm. you know, so be it. Mm -hmm. um, does he need to come to Hawaii? No, probably not. Do you um, try to ma get them to come if you can? Is there any benefit to being in the pit and think, throwing you know, ideas off each other? I think other there or? might be some benefit. I mean, the other hand, basically, you could just say, like, okay, periodically we're going to bring guys out, right? You know, people, are not, the people in the U.S. mainland aren't going to say, like, oh, Jesus, I have to spend two weeks in Hawaii right. working. So, right, right. so, I mean, I think that would be sort of the, the first step rather than trying to sort of, you know, pull people together. I mean, we're not... We're not as much basically, it's not like we're building a car, right? If you're building mm -hmm. a car, I guess you all need to be in the same place. But sure. if you're sort of, you know, building information, do you all really need to be in the same place? I think you might need more people, right? I mean, we'll need more than, you know, a handful of people in Hawaii. Mm -hmm. But do we need 70% of the people or even 50% of people in Hawaii? Probably not. Um, okay. So maybe of those 30 people, 15 only would be here. You know, it's, it's hard to guess. But I think the other thing is that, you know, see, is that I think it'd be fairly easy. I mean, when you look at basically in terms of recruiting, 
I think when it comes time to recruit people in Hawaii, it's not like you're competing against, a, I mean, and this is not to be mean, right, but you're not competing with a lot of successful companies, right? <laughs> So right. it's it's not as if to say like you know it's not like it's not like San Francisco where it's like you know yeah. well I could work for Zigner or Facebook or you it's just like <laughs> right. well you could work for Bank of Hawaii or you could work for you know HMSA or yeah. you could work for us right? right and so most guys who basically are sort of ambitious or go getters right they'll mm -hmm. say like wow you know those are good jobs right good benefits you know right. good, good work life etc but you know kind of I want to do my own thing in the future and you know this is a better way for me to do sort of more challenging things sure. and basically get those types of reps. Um, so, so do you I, see Hawaii as an advantage sometimes that you can say, look, you could do that, but you're in a rainy, cold, horrible place, or you could work uh, for me in paradise? Can in you terms of Hawaii? moving people here? Yeah. Um, or just as a recru yeah, recruiting technique in general. Maybe. I mean, I, I think with, with some people, and obviously and you know this better than me in terms of, you know, they're obviously conflicting things, right? Hawaii is a great place to live, but people have families, children, sure. living, things yeah. like that. So for certain people, it, 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 it could be an advantage. I think for, you know, for people earlier in their careers, mm -hmm. I think even more so for people who, who want to come back to Hawaii or basically have connections, uh, same thing. So Kamaina abroad that you're trying to bring back to... Sure. So I, I think basically... You know, for us, I think that the big issue will be is that I don't really see it changing that we want people ready to be experts. Because I've sort of worked through that before and said, like, you can't develop what, if, what if someone was basically, yeah. like, mid-level? What was someone just who, who's really smart mm -hmm. and we could make them sort of an expert in sort of our domain? And mm -hmm. I, I think that that model doesn't work because it takes so long for them to become an expert. Mm -hmm. It's not even the money issue involved. It's like, what would they do and could I even actually publish their work mm -hmm. in the meantime? Uh, and I know basically, you know, historically with analysts, right, like, you know, how do, how do most analysts work, right? Is it like they get a kid out of school, he doesn't know anything about what he's doing, mm -hmm. and they say like, okay, you're going to analyze basically the, the LCD market. Right. You know, and then like all these people will pay you $10,000 each mm -hmm. to get your opinion on the LCD market. Right. You know, and he's 23 years old. Right. And, you know, and, and he's the expert because he's, he's been reading about it on Google right. for and, six months. Because yeah. he called some executives, and these right. executives said like, this is the next big thing in LCDs. Right, right. So, um... Certainly, that's what people have done in the old days. I just don't think, basically, the internet basically forces things to be much more competitive. Mm. Now, I look at, basically, I mean, we compete against analysts, right? And the sure. analysts still still basically charge $5,000 a report for, basically, 50 pages of, a, basically, a book report that a 23- or 25-year-old wrote. Could have done in a month. And then that's what they did, right? And then that's right. what they're charging, right? right? And so what I'm saying, well, well, my alternative is basically our team mm -hmm. is teams of experts who have seven to ten years of experience, real experience in the in field, the industry, right? right? And these guys basically know it cold. They know the players, they know technology, they know mm -hmm. how it works, they know how it right. fails. Um, so that would be the bigger thing to me. So if there is basically a Kamina who works in Oakland that basically is in with whatever niches that we're covering, mm -hmm. great. That would be awesome, right? Yeah. If it isn't, you know, so be it. It's basically the, the next most talented guy that, you know, that I can find that really has that, um, right. that experience. And so when they come in, what is their, what is the work experience like with you? So two years on, you know, you've got a startup in Hawaii, you're two years on, are you working 16 hours a day and weekends? Are you, where are you at I mean, your, I, your life work balance? I mean, I work, I work a ton, but it, it, I don't work a ton because like I have to. I mean, part of the thing is, you know. Because you're, you're revved up and excited. Yeah, I'm saying, you know, and it, I think one of the things in the internet basically and the, the guys you basically, mm -hmm. you know, working on a team now realize like, geez, working at home is really good, yeah. right? Because like when you work at home, it's like, well, you come and go and you please basically, if I want to take basically an hour off, I want to go to Whole Foods, it's mm -hmm. like whatever, like I just go, like I don't have appointments or anything to do. Right. Um, so I think that that's a huge advantage basically in terms of I can get a ton more done, there's sure. no sort of meetings, there's no driving. Mm -hmm. Today is the farthest I've driven in, in about a year in Honolulu. Sorry for, about that. For, for work purposes. <laughs> um, so yeah, so you know, I, I think you know, that, that's another element that's, you know, that, that's been really good. It, it lets you be more productive. That's, uh, yeah, no, that's, that's an interesting thing we've discussed on TechHui quite a bit is the, um, the working at home dynamic. And it, it definitely it works for some people, right. but um, for others it doesn't. And sometimes it has to do with whether or not you've got a, you know, a crying infant that's always around mm -hmm. that uh, you end up assuming some responsibility for because you're in proximity. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it, it matters. Uh, just some individuals are very More so social, right? They yeah. want to basically, you know, so I talk about over, over yeah. and over again, like guys want to go to internet cafes and sort of, exactly. you know, be sitting next to someone else. Yes. To me, it's a distraction, right? I got enough distractions, basically emailing, Skype, right. IMing. People are trying to get in touch with you regardless, right? Mm -hmm. So it's like, well, the less people who are basically, you know, trying to sort of interact with me, the better it is for me to focus and get stuff done. Absolutely. Um, so yeah, it's definitely, it definitely differs by personality. But I think the other element is basically 
going to sleep when you want and waking up when you want. Like <laughs> I don't, I don't, I don't miss the fact of basically like, oh, I got to be in the office at nine in the morning or right. eight in the morning. Like it's just like, hey, if I, if I want to get stuff done, it's sort of one in the morning. I can get stuff at one in the morning. I just don't worry about it. I wake up whenever I sort of, I you know, I you know, I, I want to wake up. How do you handle that with the the folks that are on your team that are working for you in terms of? Uh, do you worry that if you um, sleep in one morning and you go in there that there there's gonna be a loss of discipline or that because you're not physically there with them that it kind of things fall into disarray or are they all super self-motivating no I think know, that's kinda, part of the thing of basically yeah. getting guys who are ready who are ready experts okay right like if you had basically more junior people right if you basically got a mm -hmm. bunch of kids at a school well right. that's a different situation right because sure. they basically they don't know the right work habits yet mm -hmm. they don't basically know much about sort of the industry that they're covering mm -hmm. so you're you're teaching them about how to be a professional you're mm -hmm. teaching them basically about the domain you're covering right mm -hmm. that's a ton of work we tried a little bit of that basically in the beginning and I said well this is I remember not, you telling me about it. It was not going to work. <laughs> like when I, when I was an integrator, like that actually was the right model because mm -hmm. basically it was a much basically cost was more important. Things were easier to do because it was a lot of physical work on mm -hmm. site with customers. But we don't have any physical work on site with customers. You either right. basically in this business, you know what you, you know basically something, you know some piece of advanced technology well, or mm -hmm. you don't know it well. And if you don't know it well, it's going to take me 10 hours to teach you. And then I might as well just basically write it myself, and it'll take 15 minutes, right? Right. So it's it's one of those types of things, right? So. Um, do you think you'll ever, at any size, you'd be able to develop somebody that's junior, or do you think you will always only take people know. that are already? I don't know. And is that scalable? I mean, how many of those guys are there? But I think that I, I'd, I'd spin the question on you, Dan. Okay. Basically, do I really need to get that many people, right? Because I, I don't think I need to have basically a hundred, you know, a hundred basically experts. If I had a mm -hmm. hundred experts, it'd be a ten, you know, not a ten million dollar company. It'd be a fifty million dollar company. Mm -hmm. Like I just don't think you need that many experts. Well, I guess if you're growing right. horizontally, if you're expanding your scope, I think so. If you're, then but then you, know, you, you look at basically, more, you know, right? I mean, even just myself, mm -hmm. the amount of content, even still now that I'm putting out, I mean, I'm, you know, doing sort of, you know. 20, 30, 40 pages of original sort of analysis each week. It's a lot. And yeah. so I think, and even some of our guys basically, they're doing, you know, quite a number of pages of original analysis each week. And I think it's, so I, I don't think you need a ton of people. Okay. Um, so I think that's part of the thing. Like, yeah, like, you know, if I had 10 or 15 people, like even in each domain, mm -hmm. I'd rather have basically three guys who knew things cold than a team of basically, 15 so -sos. you know, basically yeah. people out of college who are just trying to figure it out. And I think the same goes for programming or anything like that. Like, why would you need like 100 guys, you know, if, if you're basically, you know, trying to do something very well, it's actually, right, destructive to have more people. Well, um, thank you for joining us on the first edition of Tech Hui Talks here with uh, John Hanovich and uh, IP Video Market. You can visit John's site at ipvideomarket.info. And if you want to hear a continuation of the conversation, um, a lot of the threads that have started up by John, uh, I think actually the most popular thread on Tech Hui, which had about 200 some responses, was a post from John on Act 221. So we hope to see you on techhui.com. Thank you very much. Thank you.